So the objectives today would be will be to discuss the key points of uh, TMS and its development, the history of it, which is pretty neat. Um, and then we're going to review all the data supporting TMS and how it became FDA approved. Uh, we're going to review Theta Burst, which is an interesting scientific uh, mechanism of action uh, or a treatment in the functional brain networks. And uh, we're going uh, to discuss uh, when to consider TMS for your patients. So this is Luigi uh, Galvani. Um, he was the first one in 1786 to discover that electricity could stimulate um, an animal, in this case a sciatic nerve. And it's kind of interesting how they figured this out. Uh, they, were, they were taking uh, dead frogs and removing their skin and trying to rub frog tissue together to create static electricity. They thought that it, it could be electrical in and of itself. And what happened is they had like a resident there, one apprentice who had a scalpel, and the scalpel came close to the frog and uh, a static electricity shock uh, jumped into the scalpel and then over to the frog sciatic uh, nerve in a, in a contract. Uh, and that's how they discovered that uh, basically bioelectricity and did uh, experiments after that. So that's 1786. It wasn't until, and this is a story of TMS, not frogs and electricity, so I'm going to jump over to more of that realm. This is Michael Faraday as a young man and an older uh, gentleman. And Faraday, Faraday was a bookbinder and had no education. Uh, and he was living in England when uh, a philanthropist would give him tickets to go to these lectures uh, to hear people pontificate uh, about different subjects. And one of the lectures, he took such detailed notes of the lecture that he wrote a 300-page uh, binder. Like, he book, he book binded a bind, uh, his notes and gave them to the presenter afterwards because he was so interested in the topic, which had to do with uh, electricity. And so that person became his benefactor. Um, his name was Humphrey Davy. So it's interesting, Davy was in his lab and uh, Faraday was helping him out and there was an explosion and Davy was blinded and couldn't do the own, own experiments again or thereafter. So he hired Faraday to be the person that was running the experiments. And through doing that, they took this gentleman that had no education, and he I mean, obviously had you know, raw talent. Uh, but he learned more and more and more uh, to the point that he himself became a scientist. Faraday went on to discover, well, Faraday was a chemist, I should say. And so he knew a lot about batteries. And he was working with chemicals to create batteries. Um, the way he discovered Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction is, and this is the actual picture below of the magnet. That's an iron core there, and it has tish, it has, uh, what do you call it, um, a cloth around the wires. That's why you see that white cloth. And that's wrapped around this iron core, which is uh, represented by the abstract uh, schematic in the middle there. And he hooked it up to a battery, and he was trying to create uh, a magnet, magnetic force, like electromagnetic force, by turning on the battery. You would, do, you would send electric signal around this iron core. The iron core would then become magnified and would induce current in the other uh, coil you see there that's connected to the galvanometer, galvanometer. And so what happened is that he was closing the, the circuit and uh, he saw a blip of electricity go through. It was, it was generating electric pulse, but then it would dissipate and go away. And he couldn't figure it out until he thought about it and realized that you need a magnetic field fluxing uh, against a, uh, a current or a conducting surface to create current in that surface, in this case being a copper wire. So uh, does, it, does that make sense? Where the magnet actually has to be in flux and have a delta change for it to, to generate any current. And that's why, for a long time, magnets didn't work when they were trying to use them to stimulate the body. They, they couldn't do it. So that's a big deal uh, for a lot of different reasons. Now, that was, that was in the 1800s. Fast forward then to 1910. For a long time, folks were trying to use magnets and things. And this is a, a big magnet. And this is, what's name? Sylvanius P. Thompson. That's a heck of a name. Um, so he built this magnet, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't do much because the magnet has to be very focal, and it needs to be fluxing for it to, to stimulate brain tissue, which in and of itself is a conducting surface. Uh, so this didn't go anywhere. I have one at home that I try on before Saints games just to get excited. 
1982, the first peripheral stimulation with the resultant EMG uh, was in, in England, and it was in a lab, um, and this is one of the grad students in the lab is showing the peripheral stimulation. 1985, Anthony Barker was the first person to develop an actual TMS, uh, or not a TMS machine, it's, but it's a, it's a, a magnetic stimulator. <laughs> this is before they were putting it to the cranium. And they were using a per peripheral uh, stimulation of nerves. They quickly, when they thought about it, said we should do this in the brain and put it up to the brain. And the reason they didn't do it is that they really, honest to God, thought they were going to erase the hard drive if you did this. So they kind of were hesitant to do it. <coughs> this is his team. This Anthony Barker on the right side is a younger man. And that's the machine. That's the first TMS machine. And then, in 1985, was the first publication saying that they did it. So this is non-invasive magnetic stimulation of the human motor cortex. Let's see how it worked. So, TMS works simply this way. You have electricity going through a cord to that paddle, which has coils in it of, uh, you know, iron coils. And as you shoot electricity through it, uh, it, draw, it, it creates a magnetic field downward, 90 degrees to the, the, to the coil. So there's your magnet. But the magnet needs to be in flux, so it shoots rapidly. It's repetitive here in mass, because remember it has to be fluxing when it goes. So it's, it's, like, a, it's like a clicking noise, um, kind of like a mini like, shotgun going da -da 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 -da, and then it stops for 20 seconds and then it stimulates again. And when it's stimulating, you see the magnetic field uh, there shooting down into the cortex. The field then will force current to shoot through the nerve uh, by depolarizing it. Let's take a picture here, look at that. So here's the, the soma, the axon, and the axon terminus. And the magnet will cross through those nerves and then depolarize using like voltage uh, gated sodium <coughs> channels. And once you depolarize you know, one sodium channel and it lets in sodium, then you have uh, the next uh, gated uh, a channel being uh, opened and then that, that's propagated down the nerve. So this is all in like 1985. And then there was a research fellow, uh, his name is Mark George, and he's like the godfather of TMS, uh, clinical TMS as we know it. Uh, his work is out of, uh, the, uh, out of South Carolina at the, um, the university there, M MUSC. He did a, he, in 1990, he did a research fellowship in London, England, and during his fellowship, he wrote a book on brain stimulation and brain imaging, Real Bright Eye. Uh, he pioneered brain stimulation at NIMH in uh, functional brain imaging, and what, they, what he was looking for were, were normal emotions. What did those look like in our brains? So he started looking at normal emotions and then thought, well, what happens with abnormal emotions like depression? He's also the editor-in-chief in Brain Stimulation, which is the main uh, publication for TMS and all kinds of different stimulation technologies. And uh, that, was, uh, that came out, I think, in 2008. So eventually, they were looking at animal models of the brain and depression. And what they were doing was stimulating animals who had a depressive model. So their brains didn't look normal. And they saw that the animals improved. I haven't, re I haven't reviewed that study, that's why I say the general animals. Yeah. Um, but the, uh, they took uh, six folks that were depressed and they gave TMS to it, and two of them had a really rapid response. But they did not continue the study beyond five treatments, that's five days of treatment. So the person came in day one, day two, day three, day four, day five. If you weren't better by day five, they didn't continue it because they didn't want to do harm, they didn't know what was going to do. And to, and to contrast that with what we do for TMS now, is we give 30 days or 36 days of treatment. So this is a very short amount of treatment. Um, he also, they made a, pa a patient manic uh, by uh, some of the treatment too, which was an interesting point. They were, they were depressed and they actually made them manic within one day. Um, there's something else about this with the, oh, and, and so where do they stimulate? That's the next question. Well, they found that in uh, functional Im imaging that the, the left uh, prefrontal cortex, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, had hypofunctioning in a lot of these models that they were seeing. 
So they posited, well, if we stimulate that and activate that area, you know, maybe they'll be less depressed. So with this study, it started a whole slew of other studies that folks were doing. The TMS technology like, uh, uh, de became more developed and more advanced, meaning the type of machines and, and the rapidity of the, the pulses. Also, when you, when you send electricity through a coil, it heats up. So they had to come up with a way of uh, cooling down the coil, those type of things. And like with any other technology, they had to do a fine tuning where they didn't know exactly where to stimulate, how long to stimulate, how many treatments did the patient need. They didn't know how much power to give because TMS has a few different parameters, kind of like a ventilation machine. You have to kind of fine tune what you want for the patient. So you can drive up the energy and the frequency of the pulses. You can also um, drive that energy down below motor threshold. You can change how many frequencies you give uh, in, a, in a burst. You can change the length of it. So there's all kinds of parameters, which kind of makes it hard when you're doing research because it's not just taking like 20 milligrams of Prozac or something like that. You have, it's hard to compare study to study. So that's one of the reasons why at TMS there's been some murky data out there. It's hard to interpret that. Uh, so sorry, you guys are probably familiar with this. This was a study I think done in 2006 here where they had a naturalistic study of basically what we do in clinical practice. And I believe there's like four, four to five levels in it. And say so you have a patient come in, you prescribe Celexa to them. If they don't get better in Celexa, you either add Wellbutrin or you switch to another SSRI. If that doesn't work, you switch to an, either another you know, SNRI um, or you added, I believe, um, uh, uh, Buspirone, sorry, Buspar, um, Cytomel was involved, <coughs> Remeron and Effexor, and I think uh, an MAOI. And what they found is that the more times you try to treat somebody as they come back to your office, past about the second treatment, people become more and more resistant, where at every new intervention, you're only gonna get a 10% remission rate. 10% remission rate. So just think of, you know, you have the patient who's chronically depressed, and they're not suicidal, let's say, but they're just not doing that well. Um, it's that person that we don't, we don't have great data for what to do with those folks other than ECT or maybe some deep brain stimulation of some, some sort. Uh, psychotherapy, of course. And now I'm gonna get really uh, researchy on them. Uh, so I'm gonna present a, a several studies that I thought were the key studies uh, in supporting TMS. This is a controlled study of uh, RTMS in medication-resistant major depression. This is by Avery. And this was randomized in a sham controlled study, double blind study by the NMIH. 30% of the patients did take, they continued their medication. So not many patient, patients were taking medications, and these patients were very sick. There were only 68 of them. And the effect size was 0.58 to 0.68, which is medium. And to put that in perspective, for antidepressants, the, uh, the average effect size when they study this like clinically was 0.4 to 0.43. So this is just showing that there was a signal that TMS was doing something for the patients, and it wasn't just a sham, or excuse me, it wasn't just placebo. And it's that effect size that drove the industry to move forward and say, there's something here, we're gonna, we're gonna push further and see if we can uh, perfect this. The response was 30% uh, with TMS, 6% with sham, and the remission rates were 20% with re for remission and 3% for sham. So sham is basically just a coil they have on there that clicks and you feel some pressure, but it's like a muted magnetic field. This next study I'm presenting is uh, the study that helped get FDA approval for TMS. And it was done by O'Reardon, who I met at a recent meeting and he's a real uh, character of a guy. Um, but you know, uh, very, I did a lot of research uh, for, on TMS called Efficacy and Safety of TMS in the Acute Treatment of Major Depression in a Multi-Site Randomized Controlled Trial. So they had to prove it in a larger population. You can see the end value here is 301. Uh, this was supported by Neuronetics, so when you're reading research, you need to take into consideration that the people who make the machine are paying for the study. And there's some kind of inherent bias there, or it could, could be. It was randomized, controlled, and double-blinded. Uh, these were patients that had no medications who were treatment resistant. There's some patients that I fear taking off medication for what, what happened. So they washed out these patients and they're very sick. 
what they found that the number, the, the, well, I'll jump down here, the remission rates were 15% to 20%, and placebo were 5 to 8%. The number needed to treat to get somebody well was 9 for TMS, but compared to SSRIs and the program to put it in perspective, the number needed to treat is 8. Now, clinically, you might say, well, um, I don't see that in my own patients. The program lights people up and they feel much better, and, 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 but that's our own biases or bias, bias when reviewing your own patients. You know, there's no control there. And also, these, these studies are pretty strict, these clinical studies, where it's not technically as real world. And we'll see in these future studies I'll present that, uh, that the data is more favorable when patients are taking medications and getting TMS. I have uh, their FDA, FDA database. What I'm referring to there is medications. You look at the FDA database, it is patients who got better medications, there's a 40% remission rate, but placebo was 30%. So when you look at the, differ the difference between that, the 40%, 30%, there's a 10% change where the medications are actually doing what they need to do, and that's why the number needed to treat was eight. So this study was done by Mark George, who is the, uh, the TMS. Uh, uh, expert out of um, South Carolina, and this was in 2010. So this is two years after the FDA approved TMS uh, for <coughs> public use. And why they did it is because there was co controversy about the numbers. Did TMS work or not? Were the remission rates higher or not? Did the industry influence the study? And so this study was done by uh, the National Institute of Mental Health. Um, it was randomized, controlled, and double-blinded. These were also medication-free patients, and uh, the end was 199. And what they found, so this is very strict. It may not look impressive, but read between the lines here. Phase one for this uh, study was remission was 14%. Not very good if you're thinking, comparing that to star D, 10% star D, 14% here. But placebo was 5%, and it, this was at week three. The odds of attaining remission was 4.2 compared to sham. So you had a four times likely chance to uh, remit compared to sham. And put that further in perspective, like nicotine patches uh, have an odds ratio of like two. You have a two time, if you use nicotine patches, to help put smoking, not for depression. But you know. um, the other interesting thing about this, these folks were, were rated at week three. In the future research, what we find is that folks don't get better until week five or six, unless you give all the TMS in the first three weeks. But, but they just start getting better at week three. When they made the study open label, like the phase two, 30% of people remitted. And, and so it's kind of pointing in that direction that people get better the longer you do this. This is uh, an article by uh, Carpenter, and it came out, I think, just after or around that time. And so I want to give you a graph to compare people with treatment resistance and overall remission uh, and response rates. And by the way, response is just getting 50% better or more, or more, but not quite remitting. And remission is having uh, symptoms that are classified as remission on different uh, rating scales. So for the PHQ, remission would be probably below 7. Um, and then there's, you have different uh, remission rates for MADRAs. Um, for the quids, so they're using different uh, rating tools here. So this is the PHQ outcomes. You see there in the gray bar, it's a 56% uh, response rate, um, and then a 28% remission rate, um, and then they separated low treatment resistance and high treatment resistance, and what's interesting, the remission rates, the 31% and the 26% aren't that far off, and these are treatment resistant people compared to non-treatment resistant people. So what they're finding is, in some respects, that TMS can work for some people whether they have treatment resistance or not. And they're trying to figure out which patients now do, can we pick to ensure that the TMS doesn't work. These are the GCI outcomes. Um, clinical global, global um, is an impairment or improvement. This is something I don't use every day. Um, Anyways, this is 58% to 37%, so those are response rates, getting 50% better um, versus remission rates. And again here, the low treatment resistance and the high treatment resistance is 31% to 34%, so you're seeing that consistently that the remission rates stay the same between these two groups. So the question is, if, if, if TMS works for folks and you can get, if you can get them better, how long does it, 
how long does that last for, for people versus other treatments. So star D, when they did durability testing, this is what, it, what I found here, was that in the level one non-resistant uh, non patients, they had about a 60% chance of relapsing um, at 12 months. And then level two, that's if they had one prior treatment failure and they switched them or they added another medication. When they got better, and they looked at those folks who got better at, at time zero, 12 months later, they were, this is the blue line, so it's around just under 40%. And you see the level three and level four are, are around that, between 40% and 60%. So even when we can get patients to remission, can we keep them there? Because that matters. This is for, this was a community um, um, sample of community patients who received ECT, and they were looking at durability. And they looked at durability with medications, and they looked at durability without medications. So say you get ECT, and then you add on more tryptoline or lithium or whatever it is that you're gonna use. Did it matter if you used medications or did it not, and how long did the durability? And what you see is kind of similar to the star D, uh, except the big difference here is that medications definitely help people stay in remission longer after ECT. Um, and it's uh, only 30% of folks with meds uh, relapse to depression, whereas 51% without medications, and this was over 24 months. Uh, Dunner did a study in May 2006, this is actually right around the time of um, Stardy was being uh, published, where they, just treatment as usual, they found that the response rate was 11% and remission rates were 3% for patients taking medications in, in like bad populations. So pretty dismal. This is an important study by Dunner later down the road. This was in 2014, so just a couple years ago. Uh, this was supported by Neuronetics and had 257 patients. It was naturalistic, so this was just giving patients TMS and not having a sham, because by this time they've proven that they see an effect size that the TMS is, is causing remission and response. However, how long does it last for TMS? At 42 sites, and this is with patients taking medications, so what they did is they gave TMS to folks and they said, let's look at the remission and response rates there and see how long that lasts for 12 months. And so the remission after TMS, and this is six weeks of TMS, was between 30 and 40 percent. Response was 62.3 percent. And people who responded a little bit, like they didn't make it to the 50 percent mark, but they, were, they, weren't, they weren't as bad as they were when they entered the, entered the study, were only like 20 percent. And out of all these people who who had the TMS, fewer than 30% relapsed within a year. And what they found that if you took the patients who, who relapsed and you came back and you gave them like five to 16 treatments, that they still, most of those people responded, which is re really interesting. Because think about a patient who fails on a medication. Say they respond to a medication and then they relapse again and you add another medication. And we know from star D that you can't add more medication and get somebody well all of the time. It's, the, the rates are pretty low. Whereas with TMS, if somebody responded and they don't have it for a while, it's kind of like ECT, where you can apply the ECT again and get another response. This slide shows uh, the squares are the folks who didn't respond over 12 months. So they followed everybody. Uh, the, the diamond right below it are people who partially respond, responded. The, uh, the y-axis is showing um, their, their actual scores and how bad they were. So this is not how, how they improved, but if they stayed bad, they followed them over 12 months and they, and they remained bad. The triangle is for people who responded, meaning they got 50% better, and then below that, this, the circles are folks who wanted to remission. And so for those, so the folks that got better, they stayed better throughout this duration. The problem with TMS is it takes too long to do and it costs too much. Patients have to sit there for 37 minutes. It's not that big of a deal because it's relatively painless once they get used to it. Um, they can read a book or play on an iPad or something like that. But it's not good enough. And getting people 30% better to 40% better remission rates is, is good, it's, it's promising, but it needs to be better. So they're trying to make it better. And the question is, can you give TMS, or TMS multiple times throughout a day? Could you, could you give multiple times throughout a day, like bring somebody in the morning and later at night, like dose them twice daily, and then do that within 15 days rather than 30 days or 45 days? 
What's interesting is uh, a researcher named Blessing Huang in 2005 published this uh, theta burst stimulation over the human cortex. And this is kind of like TMS 2.0. And this is fascinating. They found that for the last, I guess, 30 years they've been researching uh, pyramidal cells and glial cells and how they respond to magnets in like a petri dish. And they found that neurons don't talk to each other like in single pulses, which is what we do in, in TMS. It's repetitive, but it's kind of a single pulse. To create long-term potentiation, to create memory in these cells, and I'm not talking just like in your hippocampus, I'm talking about in the prefrontal cortex here, those cells create emotion. They help you feel good and help you think. For those to, to think well, you have to create long-term potentiation. And one of the strongest ways of doing it is to give them theta burst. And theta burst is a certain frequency that actual neurons speak with to each other to create long-term potentiation. So we think that TMS, the, the preliminary research, was pretty good you know, compared to other treatments. But it would be better if they also gave theta burst signals. I'm going to explain this a little bit more. So theta burst, this is a neuron. The, the triangle is the cell body. The axon is the line, vertical line. And then the, the dendrites are at the end. Um, that's not a dendrite. That's a terminus, excuse me. And what they found that in stimulus number one, that's S1 there, that if you stimulate a nerve very quickly in rapid sequence, and then you don't stimulate it, and you wait 200 milliseconds, and then you do that again, that the first stimulus prime the neuron to accept the stimu second stimulus as long-term potentiated. So it's actually the code with which you speak to the, the nerve is going to create long-term potentiation. And even more interesting than that is if you apply this to the patient with uh, depression, and you, get, you give the theta burst, the treatments go from 37 minutes to 3 minutes and 9 seconds. And psychiatrists that I talk to who are doing this say that patients paying for TMS, they come in and they sit down for three minutes and 30 seconds or nine seconds, and they're upset because they're like, I'm paying all this money for this treatment, or my insurance company is, that it's not even as good as like a therapy session. But it's creating long-term potentiation in the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, which has staying power if you get the theta burst. I think we're doing it with TMS, the, you know, the, the TMS 1.0, because we're, we're, sh we're stimulating very frequently, but it's just a hair off of what it could be to, to have more of a robust response. And I think that's probably why people have to stay in the chair for so long. And there's some preliminary data that uh, they, they've given rapid Thetaverse TMS to patients in over a week time, week's time to get better, just as much as they would over like a 30-day course of it. So the question, can you shorten the treatment with Theta Burst? This would be 600 pulses of uh, Theta Burst stimulation over three minutes. And you can give it in 20 to 30 sessions. Now, that, you know, this is shortening the, the, the duration of the treatment, uh, like day by day, but can you do this in the morning and can you come back at night and get it? And that's the question that they're trying to figure out now. This is an article that um, I think Sadat has, uh, and I gave a copy to um, Eric Conrad. Um, why does TMS work at the dorsal? lateral prefrontal cortex. Like, what's really happening there? Do we have a model for the brain of understanding how our brain works? <laughs> we kind of know how eyesight works. We kind of know how hearing works. Emotional regulation is a kind of a black box in some respects. They've been working in functional imaging for a long time. We have uh, TMS stimulation. Um, what's happening here? So this is an article um, by Jonathan Dower, Downer in uh, Toronto that I found uh, very interesting, and I think you should read it if you get a chance. They're figuring out that there's a 17 networks of functional networks that are run parallel to each other. And some of these networks are con connected more strongly with each other than other networks. For example, when your patient gets depressed, do their eyesight go out? No. If your patient gets depressed, do they no longer hear? No, that's, that doesn't happen. Why doesn't that not happen? And I think the reason is, is that those systems in your brain, those functional systems, work in silos. They're not supposed to go out because they're so evolutionarily important. Depression, the evolution of depression is uh, more complex. 
Uh, and we think that depression occurs in the frontal lobes and underneath it, the anterior cingulate gyrus. Let's look at some of these parallel uh, networks. So the default mode is just if you're sitting there and you're not thinking of anything. The frontal parietal lobe, fr there's a frontal parietal network, a dorsal attention network, a visual, a somato somatomotor, and then a limbic system. And this is from a functional MRI data. There's ventral attention, and then the most compelling and most important for us is the anterior cingulate insular uh, network. It's also called the cingular oper opercular network, or the salience network. So let's talk about this. The idea behind the salience network and how it relates to depression is that you have three kind of linchpin parts of your brain that communicate with each other. Uh, kind of like my phone might connect, you, like, connect to a cellular tower and that tower might connect to somebody else's uh, computer. And if any one of those go out, the network disintegrates and it doesn't work. The, the, the hardware is still there, but your computer is not working. So the salience network, they're positing that the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex communicates with the anterior cingulate cortex and then the insula. And in depression, that this disintegrates and isn't functioning any longer. And you can see this in MRI, where this spot that's highlighted here is hypofunctioning compared to normals. The problem, again, though, is if I did an MRI of your brain, 15 minutes later, you might see a different fluctuation. So they've discovered this by averaging out lots of people who are depressed and lots of people who are not depressed, and, and look at the differences there. And once they've honed in on the areas that look different between those two groups, now individually they're, they're trying to fine tune, you know, in real time, before you get your TMS, do you in fact have lower functioning in your, in your left prefrontal cortex? So saliency, being able to get up and do something, being able to say to yourself, this thing's bothering me in my life right now, but I'm just not going to let it bother me. I'm going to put it to the side. When folks are depressed, they have repetitive negative thinking, and it's hard to stop it, and it's hard to, to get them, you know, pull themselves up by the bootstraps if they don't have any bootstraps to do it, if their brain's simply not working, their software's not working. So cognitive control is, I think, the behavioral or the, the phenotype uh, at the assailants network where you're able to control your thoughts and to have more positive messaging, where your positive thoughts outweigh the negative thoughts in, in a sense, or you have corrective thinking. So we know through psychotherapy this happens by learning how to do it. But if someone's so depressed that they can't, they can't even learn it because their brain isn't functioning, through stimulation and also through medications, which also stimulate the frontal lobe, uh, they can then begin to do the therapy. And what we found in, in TMS is that as patients get TMS for uh, many weeks, they get better, but then they're like, i got to deal with my life now. And I have all this pain from being abused when I was a kid. Um, I'm unemployed. And they have to uh, redesign their life and, and, and to process these things that have happened to them. And that's why therapy is really important uh, during TMS and you know, after TMS. And, and they're refining this uh, research. And the question is, is TMS bringing this network back online? And what they do see is that after TMS, brains do recover. So you actually see a change in the brain. Why don't we order functional test uh, MRIs before and after TMS? It's not as practical. Um, it'd be like ordering one maybe before or after giving someone a trial of medication. Although I think as the price of uh, MRI technology comes down and the insurance companies cover this type of treatment for mental illness, as we're seeing a sea change at the governmental level, um, it, it would be nice to be able to order an MRI and say, yeah, you have left prefrontal cortex hypometabolism. And we need to get that, that back online, either with medications, therapy, or TMS, ECT, something. So some thoughts for you uh, is, is my patient beyond four to five trials of medication? Have they tried many different things and they're not getting better? Does my patient have poor cognitive control, pushing away negative thoughts? There's an idea that, that the, the frontal lobe is not a silo. And it's kind of the cross, neural crossroads of your brain because it's driving behavior, right? So it needs to be connected to everything else. And, um, and in folks who have a, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder or borderline personality disorder, if you improve their cognitive 
control that they can get better too. So we're learning now that maybe this could help with folks with general cognitive control problems. Other questions, does my patient have insurance? TMS is covered by insurance. Um, and I want to the extent of even going in network for just TMS because it's an expensive treatment. I think the price will come down over time as well. But if they have insurance, uh, they, I think Humana, United Healthcare, and Blue Cross Blue Shield will cover it. Will my patient benefit from being 50% better? This is a key question because we have a lot of patients there that on a PHQ, maybe they're at a 12 or a 14 and they're going to work. But what if they were 50% better? What if somebody is in bed all day and can't get out of bed? If they were 50% better, what would they do? Could they get a part-time job? Could they have a life again? Does my patient have to trouble tolerating medications? Uh, we had a patient referred from a psychiatrist in town who was taking a stimulant to help him keep active throughout the day and was taking like 30 milligrams of Valium to help sleep because his depression was causing a insomnia, and couldn't tolerate SSRIs, uh, just really bad side effects. They tried multiple different uh, medications. Uh, he got TMS, and what he told me was about the third week, he came and sat in my office, and I said, how are you doing? And I'm hopeful that this is going to help him. And he said, I haven't, uh, I, I didn't want to leave my room uh, yesterday morning. I said, well, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking he's, he's still depressed. He said something interesting said, you know, I haven't felt this way in such a long time. I was afraid that if I left my room, that it would get, the feeling would go away. I'm like, well, what feeling are you re relating? And he said he felt so good that he could actually feel himself again. He wasn't numbed out. And, and then this gentleman actually said, well, now that I'm feeling better, I'm going to have to start living and looking for a job. And he, he started entering psychotherapy before or, or again. He had been in therapy, and, and he hadn't seen his therapist for a long time, but he was seeing a psychiatrist. I thought that was just a powerful example that for some patients this works well. And he's still doing a lot. I talked to him uh, last week. Uh, I think he went on a trip for the 4th of July. I uh, was going on a trip for the 4th of July and, and still is in remission. I think his PHQ was uh, 14 or 15 and it was 5 when we were done. Other questions. If you had to add new medications for your patients, how would they tolerate those new medications? And would it be worth the side effects from them. I'm, I'm, oh, I'm a firm believer that you keep on fighting. You use Cytomel, use lithium, um, check patients' labs, make sure they don't have low vitamin D or you're missing something. But at some point, if you add on medications like Remeron or tricyclic antidepressants, uh, lithium, mood stabilizers, you, you, are, this, uh, are the side effects worth it? The next question is, does my patient have complex medical problems? And are they on multiple medications? And we, and we know exactly what I'm talking about. We have patients who are, have nine medications in their med list, uh, other psychiatric medications or uh, general medical, and you say, would adding on more medications be helpful for them? 